I received a text message from a friend at around 2 a.m. Where you at? Let's have a drink. Come pick me up at our usual spot. I called her on her mobile, but she didn't answer, and so I replied to her text. Why are you not answering? Answer the freaking phone. I received a reply from my friend after about five minutes. I can't answer your call right now. Can you just come for me? This is not the way she normally speaks, so I thought maybe something bad might have happened. My friend has a bright and cheerful personality, and this depressing message had me worried. She seemed a little down, so I felt it was only right that I go cheer her up. When I got to our meeting spot, I had a funny feeling that she might be playing a prank on me. So instead of waiting for her at the spot, I decided to hide nearby, where I would have a clear look at her when she arrives. I got to my hiding spot and peeked my head out around the corner. Instead of my friend standing at the meeting spot, I see two vans parked with their engine running. At first, I thought they were road cleaning vehicles, but then it occurred to me that maybe this was part of the prank. So now my intention was to turn this prank into a failure, and I cunningly texted. I'm almost there. Are you there yet? Not even a minute had passed after sending the message when I saw the two vans turn off their engine. Four big bulky guys got out of the vans and they spread out in different directions to where I couldn't see them anymore. Then one last man got out and he stood next to the vehicles. I was nearly peeing at this point because I was so scared. The thoughts kept repeating in my head, "Is this for real? Is this actually happening?" My heart was beating so fast that I could barely breathe, but the fear was so great that I couldn't even move a muscle. I tried to control my breathing because I feared they might be able to hear me, but it was futile as my heart wouldn't stop racing. About 15 terrifying minutes had passed in dead silence when I saw the four men who had disappeared regroup by the van. They exchanged a few words and then hopped inside the van. My muscles started to relax a little, and I felt like I could breathe better. But then, out of nowhere, <clears throat> what an awful timing! I was hiccuping like I was broadcasting my location. I could sense right away they've heard me. I didn't even turn around to look if they were giving chase, and I just ran as fast as my wobbly legs could take me. I ran like a crazed person. I didn't want to die. I looked forward and just ran. I was pretty much out of my mind when I arrived home, but after a few minutes, my senses came to life. I swiped my mobile to check for further messages, and I saw that I had received a group chat message. The message was from my friend, the real owner of the mobile phone, and it read, "I haven't contacted anyone tonight. Please don't go anywhere instructed by my number. It's not me. Call the cops and report it." Then I checked the text message, and it read, "When are you coming?" Did you leave already? I'm sure I'm not the first victim of this trap. Please share this story with everyone you know. We cannot allow these creeps to hurt anyone else. Merely witnessing the situation I could have been in was terrifying enough. Now think about the people who have actually fallen for that trap. I don't even want to imagine what comes next. My grandparents live about two hours' drive away from my place. The town they reside in is just your run-of-the-mill farm town, but the atmosphere is so pleasant that once I got my motorcycle license, I would often visit them just to soak in the wonderful energy of the place. My grandparents would greet me with open arms whenever I visit, 
but unfortunately, it's been decades since the last time I've been there. To be precise, I was in my sophomore year in high school, the last time I've ever visited that place. One important thing to note here is that it's not that I didn't go, but I can't go there. Let's trace back to where all this began. It was spring break. I had just finished the last semester of my sophomore year in high school. I had no special plans for the day, but the beautiful weather coaxed me into visiting my grandparents. I grabbed my helmet and got on my motorcycle. The weather was somewhat chilly, but it was a clear day, so the ride felt refreshing. Once I arrived at my grandparents, the first thing I wanted to do was to enjoy the nice breeze. I lay down, curled one of my arms under my head, and relaxed, admiring the clear blue sky. The cool breeze pleasantly rode my skin, and the sunlight blanketed me with warmth. But then I heard something. Oh, oh, oh. It was the most peculiar thing I had ever heard. The sound wasn't mechanical. Rather, it sounded like a person was saying it in an unnatural manner. I couldn't exactly make out whether the sound was po or bo. Maybe it was something in between. I sat up and turned my head to see what it was, and I could see a white, wide brim women's hat barely clearing the fence. The hat wasn't hung on the fence because it was moving to the side, and when it got to the end of the fence, I could see a woman appear wearing it. The fence had kept the woman out of view, and that was why the hat looked like it was floating in the air. The woman was wearing a matching colored dress, but the fence is nearly seven feet high. If she's taller than the fence, just how tall is this woman? I looked at her surprised, but not much else was going on inside my head. Then she walked away and went out of sight. Once the woman was gone, the pole sound was no longer audible. I thought she was either a tall woman wearing a pair of killer high heels, or maybe it was a man who enjoys cross-dressing. I had no reason to dwell on it at the time. Late afternoon, my grandparents came back after working the fields, and I mentioned to them about the woman. I saw a really tall woman earlier. Do you think it could be a man cross-dressed? My grandpa looked disinterested. As he said, "Oh, really? That person was taller than the fence, and she walked around repeating the word, 'po po po.'" My grandparents froze as soon as I said those words. Then my grandpa angrily started asking question after question. When did you see her? How much taller was she than the fence? He kept asking questions angrily. I was taken aback because. It was the first time I had seen my grandpa lose his cool, but regardless, I answered all his questions. Grandpa then went into the living room, and I could hear him talking on the phone with someone. I couldn't make out what he was saying, but I could positively confirm my grandma was shaking like a leaf. Grandpa came back to us after the phone call and said, "You must sleep here tonight." No matter the reasons, we can't let you go home today. All I could think was, just what did I do that was so bad? But I couldn't come up with any reason. It's not like I went over to the woman. It was in fact her who decided to show herself to me. Grandpa hastily got ready to go out and drove away in his car, after only mentioning that he had to bring someone over. I cautiously asked Grandma just what the heck was going on, and she began to explain. You've been possessed by the eight feet ghost, but there's nothing to worry about. Grandpa will take care of it for you, no matter what. Grandma then told me more in detail about the ghost until Grandpa returned. She explained that the eight feet ghost was trapped in our town. It's tall, like the name suggests, and its body is more masculine than feminine. 
It laughs in a morphed, manly voice, and it repeats the words "po po po." Depending on the person who sees it, it's sometimes a young woman in a funeral dress, other times a middle-aged woman in a farmer's attire, and it's also been seen as an old woman in a kimono. They all look different, but they're all female, tall, and they all have some type of a hat on them. No one really knows what he's trying to say, and people say that it was probably brought to our town, stowed safely in a possessed visitor's body. But it's only a speculation. Buddha statues have been erected surrounding the town to ensure the spirit couldn't escape to other regions. As it had been for as long as she remembers, those who were possessed by the eight feet ghost have all passed away within a few days. This information I found out later in life, but I've discovered the reason for keeping the ghost trapped in their town. As it turns out, it was a deal that was made with a neighboring town, with the agreement to have monopoly on the use of the lake water that borders the two towns. The spirit resurfaces once every few decades, and it's rare that it comes back only after a few years. So the townspeople felt it was something they could adequately deal with. But let's go back to that fateful day. I was being overloaded with all those information, but none of it felt real to me. Eventually, when Grandpa came back, he brought along an old lady with him. Without even saying a simple hello, she abruptly handed me a paper talisman and instructed me to keep it close. She then went into an empty room on the second floor, and I could hear her bustling about, but I had no idea what exactly she was doing. My grandma didn't leave my side for a second from that moment. She even accompanied me to the bathroom, and she wouldn't let me close the door. Right about that point, I began to realize how serious of a situation I was in, and I was truly scared for what was to come. A few hours had passed, and my grandpa told me to come upstairs with him, where the old lady was waiting for me. I went into the room she was prepping, and the first thing I noticed was that the windows had all been covered with newspapers and paper talismans. Then I looked on the floor, and I could see four small tables on each corner of the room. Each table had a plate full of salt in them. In the center of the room, there was a small wooden box and a small Buddha statue placed on top of it. It somewhat resembled the setup used in funerals, but obviously it was for a different purpose. Lastly, there were two chamber pots so that I wouldn't have to go outside to use the bathroom. Grandpa's last instructions before leaving me alone in the room were: the sun will set shortly. Now listen carefully. You must not come out of this room until the sun rises tomorrow morning. Neither I or your grandma will call for you overnight. So no matter what you hear, you must ignore it. You can come out of the room at 7 a.m. sharp, but not a minute earlier. I'll call your mom and dad to let them know you're sleeping over. I could see the tension on Grandpa's face. And all I could do was to nod to let him know I understood. The old lady was the last person to speak to me before I was left alone in the room. Remember every words your grandfather spoke to you and follow every instruction. Keep the talisman with you no matter what. Alone and scared, I turned on the TV for a little distraction, since they told me it was okay to watch TV. I had my eyes fixated on the screen, but none of it was registering in my brain. I got hungry, so I ate the rice cakes Grandma had prepared for me. But it was more like filling an empty stomach rather than enjoying a meal. Eventually, I found myself shaking in fear inside the blanket, and at some point, I must have fallen asleep. Because I was awoken by the sound of an infomercial that was on TV, I checked the clock on the wall, and it was 1 a.m. This was a time when mobile phones didn't even exist. I was upset because I had hoped to sleep through the night and pretend that this had never happened in the morning. 
With the burden of knowing that I had another 6 hours to go before I was safe, I just couldn't manage to go back to sleep. And that's when I heard. It didn't sound like someone was throwing a pebble on the window, but more like a hand gently tapping on it. In my heart, I knew it wasn't the wind, but I tried to convince myself that it must be a strong gust making funny noises on this old house. I drank some water to try to calm myself down, but I could barely down a gulp because I was so tensed up. Scared to death, I turned up the TV volume, got under the blanket and peeked at the TV through a small crease between the blanket and the floor. Suddenly, I heard Grandpa's voice outside the door. Sweetheart, you can stop now if this is too scary for you. I instinctively got up to open the door, but then I remembered what Grandpa told me. He said he would not call for me overnight. Then the voice spoke again. What's wrong, sweetheart? If this is all too much for you, I assure you, you can come out now. The voice was unmistakably Grandpa's, but I knew it couldn't be him. I began to imagine who could actually be outside the door, and the thought sent shivers down my spine. I looked at the plates on the four corners of the room, and I could clearly see the outer edge of the salt facing the walls had turned black. I squeezed the paper talisman as hard as I could and sat hunched down, shivering uncontrollably. That's when I heard it again. Paul. Oh, 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 oh. Then the windows started shaking and my head filled with the images of the woman I had seen earlier in the day. The thought of her pushing against the window so violently and the look of her blank expressionless face was enough to make me go insane. I turned my body to face the Buddha statue and I began praying for my life. Please let me live. Please let me live. It was the longest night of my life, but morning arrived on schedule. I opened my eyes and the first thing I saw was the morning news broadcast on TV. The time on the left corner of the screen read 7.30 AM. The window had stopped rattling and the voice was also no more. In retrospect, I believe I must have fainted during my prayer. I headed downstairs and saw my dad waiting for me there. Grandpa was calling for us from outside, so we stepped out of the house and found him with a bunch of strangers. There was a large passenger van parked in the driveway and a few men were standing by. They seemed to be neighbors of my grandparents. The van was a nine passenger vehicle. My grandpa sat in the driver's seat, my dad sat shotgun, in between them was the old lady from the day before, and I sat in the middle row surrounded by eight human bodies. A man, perhaps in his 50s, was sitting next to me on the right, and he spoke to me before we drove off. Put your head down, and no matter what happens, don't you open those eyes. We can't see her, but you can. So keep your eyes closed until we tell you that it's safe. He said those words with a concerned look on his face, and my grandpa then started driving. Not long after we started moving, the old lady proclaimed that things would get difficult from here on. She began to say prayers, and that's when I heard from the outside of the car, It was those words again. I squeezed the paper talisman in my hand, but for a briefest of the moment, I was tempted to look and I squinted my eyes to get a glimpse of what was happening. A woman with unusually long limbs was incredibly keeping up with the van's speed. She was contorting her body in weird angles to try to look inside the van. She was so tall that her head was sticking above the van's roof and she struggled to get low enough to get a good look at me. I let out a tiny squeak and the man next to me realized that I had my eyes open. He angrily shouted, Don't look! Petrified, 
All I could do was to hold on to the talisman and pray for this to be over. Then I heard the woman or it was hitting the window to get my attention. It looked as though no one else could see her, but they could still hear what she was doing. My heart was racing and I let out a tiny scream every time she smacked the window. Through all that, we had finally arrived at the edge of the town where the Buddha statues had been erected. I got out of the van to switch cars into my dad's. My grandpa bowed with respect to those who accompanied us there, and I just stood there dumbfounded, still squeezing the paper talisman tight in my hands. My dad held my hand to comfort me, and I saw that the talisman had turned black. But not just black, it was more like it was burnt. Grandpa and Grandma told me that the spirit couldn't come after me past the town's border and they reassured me that I was safe now. The old lady handed me another paper talisman before leaving and she told me to keep it with me at all times, just in case. My dad and I came back home afterwards and decades had passed since the incident. I quickly went back to my normal routine and life since has been so normal that it's boring. I can't even recall a bad nightmare. My grandparents had passed some time ago and there's only one reason why I'm writing this. I just heard the news from an old friend I knew from my grandparents town. There was a car accident at the edge of the town. A man was killed in the crash while driving under the influence. I've just been notified that one of the Buddha statues had been destroyed in the accident. That is it for this video, I hope you will enjoy it. Originally the plan was to release this video and as well as a subscriber submitted story video, but unfortunately my friend was not able to translate the last story for me and I had to do it myself with my less than ideal command of the Japanese language. The translation took forever, but in all honesty, I think it was well worth it. I obviously have no idea what all of you may think of the stories, but I for one have loved it and it was scary as hell when I first read it. Everyone's busy living their lives so I don't think I can continue to ask my friend to make the translation for me going forward. Uh, these stories take a really long time to turn them into a video so do let me know if you don't like them for some reason and I'll stop making them. Let me know what you think of the stories, what you thought of the stories in the comment section. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.